So I think it was clear that George Osborne had in his sights Middle England as the people who wanted to be the largest beneficiaries of his kind of budget beneficence. Um, what we saw were some quite tough tax avoidance measures, um, cracking down on non-DOMs at, at the very wealthy end of the spectrum and further restrictions on pension tax relief for those on the very highest incomes and then also a real drive to deliver the 12 billion out of um, the, off the benefits bill as quickly as possible um, and I think that will hit the sweet spot for Middle England when combined with the changes to increase the personal income tax allowance more and also to change the higher rate threshold. But I think there will be a lot of people working on low incomes who will feel, well, probably be very uncertain about how it will impact them. And it's not clear that how the incentives there will work. There may be some people who will see some big changes to their tax credits, some big changes to their income through the national living wage, but they won't be clear whether they'll be better or worse off as a result. I think um, it's not entirely clear what impact that some of these changes will have on the public sector. We know that we're going to see further wage restraint for public sector workers with um, pay increases limited to 1% over the next four years. The national living wage will impact in some key sectors um, and will potentially have quite a big impact on local government as well. If you look at social care, for example, we know that a vast proportion of that spend goes on pay and that a lot of the people working in the, the care sector are on very low incomes and on low wages so that could have quite a significant impact there that I think local government will have to factor in. Um, similarly the housing benefit changes, um, who knows how that may then impact on the, um, the responsibility that local authorities will have in dealing with people coming forward with homelessness because ultimately you know, if these changes impact on people's ability to pay their rent um, and they ultimately become homeless, the local authority still has a responsibility to find them housing. And I think actually housing is probably one of the weakest areas of the budget. We've seen some kind of big headlines on um, extending the right to buy, um, w which would offer very, very large incentives to people that can afford to have mortgages. But at the same time, we're seeing restrictions to people on higher incomes who are claiming social rent. So I think the government is kind of looking both ways in that they want to reduce the amount of subsidy they give to them through rent, yet at the same time will be equally happy to give um, potentially quite well-off um, social tenants a £100,000 discount on the opportunity to buy their home. So I think there's not really very clear thinking there. And of course, we will have to wait to the spending round to see how some of the public spending cuts will impact on local government. And if we look back through previous spending rounds, all too often what happens is that local government end up basically being the balancing item of, spend, item of spending cuts. So we know that defence is protected, we know that education is protected, we know that international development is protected. That means that on average, I think for unprotected departments, cuts over the next three years are going to be around 15%. But I think, you know, of course that will be a spectrum. And I think local government will be, you know, once again, looking to a very, very tough spending round settlement. I think it's very difficult to have a sensible discussion around poverty because, I mean, ultimately we need a whole range of measures to inform how policy can best be targeted to helping people from the most disadvantages, disadvantaged backgrounds. I think having one that refers to um, average incomes is just a measure that remains equally valid and insightful to kind of helping understand how we can best help people on, on lower incomes and in more difficult circumstances. But obviously it does have some rather perverse fallouts where you know um, an increase uh, you know decreases in average wages then actually could mean reductions in child poverty which doesn't really tell us anything about what's impacting on those people's life chances you know it, so i think we need to have kind of a more intelligent and nuanced um, discussion around that rather than trying to boil it down to one measure which may be useful in some respects but may actually be quite distorting and not give us the full picture in others So I suppose it's for any party to set out where they think their priorities are and part of that can be about saying where they think areas of spend should be protected. Um, so I think kind of that's the prerogative of a party but I think equally 
governments need to be clear about what the implications are for other departments. And I think for a large number of unprotected departments, what that basically equates to is departmental spending cuts of heading up to 40% since 2010. And I think in some areas we will be getting to the point where um, there is a much higher risk of service failure um, and where I think questions will be raised about the capacity of departments to continue to do their job. So really what I'm more in, and I think what it can distract from is it can, you know, I think all departments and all public services need to be thinking about how they meet longer term challenges and think, thinking about transforming themselves rather than just simply doing less because there's less money. And I think sometimes, um, you know, there's a danger that purely talking about numbers and budgets distorts that argument. I think that um, it has allowed him to deal with one of the most difficult things that came out of the March budget this year was this kind of argument that there will be a roller coaster. Um, he has got rid of the roller coaster element of that issue, um, but actually it's still quite a steep, you know, it's a straight line, but it's still quite a steep line. And I think, you know, shouldn't underestimate the challenge that that's going to pose for departments in, in kind of meeting that objective because, um, you know, 10 years of austerity is a very, very long time and my personal view is that actually you know we should be once the public finances have recovered we should be investing growth back into departments to kind of reflect the fact that they've had to cope with you know very very challenging fiscal circumstances over the last 10 years. I think um, you know with George Osborne it's always a political budget and actually with Gordon Brown before him, it, the calculations were always political ones, um, and that obviously, you know, was a very large part of their decision. I think it's a problem for government actually that too many decisions are um, taken on a short-term basis. That big long-term structural problems, um, it's too easy to kind of move them to the right. I think actually one of the challenges for later budgets in this parliament is that there are very big issues around um, our ageing society and the pressures on social care for example where it's been possible to defer making some of those tough choices for another five years or for another few years and I think the point at which you can continue to come to do that is coming to an end so I think we will have to see some big issues being faced up to and I think you know George Osborne had an opportunity to do that early in this parliament um, but he chose not to and he may regret that in later parliaments and in later budgets. <laughs>